thanks, uh, Steph. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me to give a chat about uh, Queensland fruit fly for garden advisors and nurserymen today. Um, my name's uh, Andrew Jessup, and I've been working on pest fruit flies for quite a few years now, and um, with the New South Wales Department of Agriculture, and also with the International Atomic Energy Agency in, in Europe. So fruit flies are a big problem all around the world, and they're starting to become more of a problem in some of the areas in southern, New, southern Australia where they've never had real problems before. And your area uh, around that part of uh, northeast, northwestern Melbourne is a prime example for that. So what we're going to talk about is what Queensland fruit flies are, um, what fruit and veggies they attack, what they look like, um, and how you can actually manage the problem in the home garden and the orchard. But first of all, I'd like to talk about some of the definitions that we're using because a lot of people get quite uh, confused about some of these terms. So the first is the bait. A bait is a mixture of um, attractants, such as a food attractant, such as protein or Vegemite or something like that, that's actually applied with, a mix with water and sometimes with a pesticide mixed in with it and just splashed on into various spots uh, on the foliage trunk um, or, of a, or on a surface and that attracts flies to it. They eat the protein as a source of food, pick up some pesticide and then die after that. So that compares with a cover spray is where you actually spray the whole orchard or the whole plant uh, with a pesticide um, so that when um, the insect either lands on it or feeds on it, um, it dies. A trap is just a container that is hung in a tree or nearby and it's got a lure inside the trap uh, and possibly a pesticide, a sticky surface or water in which the insect is arrested or, it, or dies or drowns inside the trap. So the trap attracts the flies to it and the flies don't come out. MAT or male annihilation technique is something like the insides of a trap, the lure and the toxicant, but without the trap. So you actually attract the flies to the lure, they feed on the lure and any pesticide with it and then die. The only difference between a trap and a male annihilation is that at least when the trap you can see the fly has been caught and it's dead, whereas the other way you don't see the fly because there's no trap. Bait station is similar to a male annihilation, except it attracts females also. So it's got some protein in it and some pesticide, uh, and it's just hung in a tree. It attracts the flies to it, uh, and then the flies feed uh, on both the, 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 the protein and the uh, pesticide and then die. Again, you don't know if it's happening or not, because uh, unless, until you start getting fruit without fruit fly in it, um, and the last one is a lure, which is just something that attracts a fly to it. So basically we have a difference between things with lures in them, so bringing the fly to the, to the toxicant, or covering the whole area with a toxicant, and when the fly just lands on it or gets hit by the toxicant, it dies that way. Okay. So we've got pretty much every single fruit and vegetable that, that can be grown, that gets fruit on it, can be infested with Queensland fruit fly. Going from A to Z pretty much. Um, this, this list here was actually an amalgama amalgamation of some information from Agriculture Victoria and the internet. Um, and it shows a very vast range of uh, crops that can be infested by fruit, fruit fly. But, some of them are sometimes said to be infestable with Queensland fruit fly and others are not. So it depends on the market you're sending to. Here we have a table where fruit fly host status on these crops is questionable. So if there's a tick, then it is a host. If there's a cross, then it's not a host. If there's a single question mark, it's a host in the laboratory, but never been found in the field. And a double question mark, says it's a host in some lists, but not in others. So 
that last one occurs with cucumbers, melons and pumpkins, the cucurbitaceous uh, plants, where these, if you're grown in southern, southern Australia, are unlikely to be infested with Queensland fruit fly. There's a lot better uh, uh, products around like peaches and apples and uh, so forth. Coffee berries, they thought were, were inf infestable with Queensland fruit fly at some stage, but tests have proven that they're not. Uh, chocos, definitely not. Uh, lily pillies, we're not even sure. Some records say they are, but a lot of people have never found fruit fly in lily pillies. Asian pears, which are um, planted a lot in country uh, New South Wales and Victoria uh, in new home uh, new homes for architectural display. They're a beautiful tree with flowers and column and a habit, habit and little fruit, which are not a host. Pineapple's not a host, monstera is not a host. Olives and rose hips are. Uh, flowering quince and street trees, flowering prunuses are. Um, even clivia uh, apparently is, although I've never seen it. Up in Queensland, where there's more flies around, um, that's where you would find more likely to be a host. Some uh, fruit are actually resistant to Queensland fruit fly, but not necessarily fruit Queensland fruit fly um, proof, particularly crops that are harvested before Christmas, particularly in southeast Australia, locusts, apricot and cherries. If you can get them harvested before Christmas, then the likelihood of them being infested with Queensland fruit fly is low, unless the Queensland fruit fly population for some reason is very high in spring. Small shiny fruit are often resistant to cherry tomatoes and Roma tomatoes are sometimes resistant to fruit fly because of their such shiny uh, slippery fruit that the flies can't land on them properly to, to uh, dig a hole into them to lay their eggs. Um, limes and finger limes are also not a host, particularly when they're still green. Lemons are not a host except some varieties of lemons, such as lemonades and Maya lemons are a high host. So you have to be careful of that. Fruits that ripen in the winter um, are also non-host and eggplants and the cucurbits are, slight, are resistant to, to Queensland fruit fly too. So now we're going to have, so out in your garden or your orchard, Ideally, you should have some fruit fly traps to see if you've actually got flies there or not. Um, but, what it, but the things that you catch in traps are not always fruit flies. So don't be scared if you find something in there that looks like a fruit fly because not all, they are not always a pest fruit fly. So here's some of the flies that you might find. So in this yellow panel here on the left, this is a Queensland fruit fly, the largest fly. And Next to it are three smaller flies, which are often called um, fruit fly, but they're, they're Drosophila or vinegar fly. And vinegar flies tend to be attracted to some of the same protein baits that the um, Queensland fruit fly is attracted to. Vinegar fly tend to uh, attack fruit that's already rotten or overripe. And in fact, you'll probably find a lot of them buzzing around your fruit bowl in your kitchen if you've got an overripe banana or a bunch of grapes in there. They seem to come out of nowhere, but they are not a pest. They're a nuisance, but they're not um, an, uh, an economic pest. On the right hand, the blue panel here, I've got two flies at the top, which have got um, dark edges on their wings. These are not Queensland fruit fly, but they will go to the same male trap that Queensland fruit fly do. These are native pests, native insects, but they are not pests. In fact, no one knows much about what they live on, probably some uh, native fruit which, uh, which are not used commercially. The three flies below in this blue panel, ranging from small to large, are all Queensland fruit fly. They just show you that they can grow from around six millimetres long to about eight millimetres long. And there's a few other flies around in the garden too. The island fly, um, the boatman fly, and this one is the metallic green tomato fly, which sometimes gets into green tomatoes.
out in the garden, there's a lot of different flies around. And in fact, most of these flies are good for the garden. These ones, particularly these three on this side, um, are all garden flies that help um, eat up organic and animal material, decaying material. So blowflies uh, and so dung, dung flies and so forth. The ones on this side are beneficial uh, insects that look a bit like flies. There's a sepsid up here that um, not only does it feed off decaying vegetable matter, but it also feeds off uh, dead flies and so forth. The long-legged fly, um, its, it's uh, larvae eat thrips and aphids, as does the hoverfly. So there's some beneficial ones. You don't often get these in traps though. They're just around in the garden. So any questions? So what we've gone through is a list of all the fruit um, or most of the fruit that can be uh, infested by, in, by Queensland fruit fly. And it's found that most of them can be, but there were a few exceptions that are a little bit more resistant or some like the chocos and the limes that are not host at all. And look at some of the that trends. was a great first segment. Thanks, Andrew. Um, in your previous slide, when uh, landholders might catch a fruit fly in their trap, um, what kinds of features should they be looking for as a go-to to ID a fruit fly compared to something else that might be a fruit fly? Yeah, um, I think the best way of looking for a fruit fly, I'll just put this slide on here. Um, this one, it's a little bit blurry. The main things are, it's a brown to black fly, about mm -hmm. six to eight millimetres long. It has yellow shoulder pads. Mm -hmm. up here. It's got um, yellow uh, GT stripes, as we sometimes call them, um, and yellow on the back of the, the uh, thorax here. Um, so yellow and brown by and large, its wings are generally quite clear with a little bit of um, furriness in it. But having the, that waspy shape, brown and the yellow are the, probably the main uh, the features. Um, there's one or two flies around like those other ones I mentioned, mm. that are more wasp shaped that can be confused, but they're a little bit bigger than the okay. fruit fly. Very good, so we've got size, brownish body and now yellow racing stripes. Yellow racing stripes. And yellow That's shoulder right. pads. That's right, yep. Very good, thanks. Okay, moving on, we've got, we're going to describe now how fruit fly can become a problem very quickly. Um, and that sort of implies that if you can get onto fruit flies early in the season or before they get into your region, um, you can save yourself a lot of trouble because once they're in, uh, they can re reproduce very, very quickly in large numbers. So, for example, um, in the laboratory once a few years ago, we collected a single female and we allowed her to mate um, uh, overnight. And we collected the number of eggs that she laid over a period of 66 days. So in that time, she laid over 2,000 eggs. And of those 2,000 eggs, 970 pupae formed. And out of those pupae, we got 800 odd fertile adult flies, half of which were female and the other half male. That is a laboratory um, uh, system, in a laboratory system where uh, conditions were ideal for fruit fly survival. But they can show you the potential of one female, one mating, laying over 400 or producing 400 adult females in her lifetime. So that's a 400 times um, multiplication of the number of flies potentially. So you can see how quickly uh, it can um, get out of control. Here's a pile of fruit flies, 120,000 of them, that we collected from nine fairly small untended Fijoa trees and a number of years ago. So we collected all the fruit from the tree and from the ground underneath them and read all the flies that were in them out and then counted them. So, so nine trees in one season, 
um, from about uh, in probably around about April, March, April, 120,000 flies came out of those fruits. So if you don't look after your fruit um, and you've got a population of fruit fly buzzing around, that's the sort of population explosion you can get. So where did those 120,000 flies go if I hadn't have collected them? Where would they have gone? They would have gone into other fruiting trees at the time uh, or gone into winter refuge mode um, so that they could pop out again in springtime next season. So that, that too, as a second example of how quickly they can establish themselves. So what is the life cycle of the Queensland fruit fly? So here we are with the adult fly. And you can see uh, what I was telling you about generally brown body with some black in it, the racing stripes, the shoulder pads, and the mostly clear wings except for along the wing edge. Um, and this one here, we see that uh, little thing sticking out there, that's the ovipositor. That's the female. I'll get back to it. That's a female and she can actually, her ovipositor is, is about as long as her abdomen is and so can spread out like a concertina um, effect, a telescope, telescope uh, and then in, uh, um, penetrate the skin of the fruit and lay its eggs through that. But before she can do that, she has to find a male uh, and mate with him. Um, generally, Queensland fruit fly mates only uh, in the late afternoon, uh, just before dusk, and the temperature has to, at the time, has to be above around about 15, 16 degrees Celsius. If it's not above that, then the flies, it's too cold for the flies to mate. Um, so in September, in August, in fact, in many parts of Victoria, some of the late afternoons are getting towards the 16 degree mark. And if there's flies around that have survived over the winter, that's when they will start to mate again. And it only takes about two days or so uh, after the mating before they're ready to lay eggs, as you can see here in this cherry. Let's see if we can make this work. So you see here a female uh, fly at the right at the bottom there in sort of um, sub, uh, not, not fully well exposed. And in front of her is the male fly and he's buzzing his wings and in so doing, making a sound um, which attracts the female, but he's also taking off from his backside with his legs every now and then a globule of pheromone, which he then, uh, see that's, that's what he's doing there now. And he's putting that uh, on a hair on his, uh, on his abdomen and rubbing it with the wings and volatilizing it so that the uh, smell from the pheromone wafts off into the orchard. And um, I'll do it again. And that's how the females find where the males are. Often the males get together in a group or a lek as they're called, uh, and then um, all get together making the sound with their wings and spreading the pheromone out with, with also with their wings and bringing the females in. So when the, when the females come in, she then selects which male she wants to mate with and, and they, off they go. Okay, so we've got eggs in the fruit, the eggs hatch the, uh, and the larvae grow from around about two millimetres long up to around about eight to nine millimetres long. Um, and here's a picture of of a mature uh, fruit fly larva. It's a third instar larva in a fairly green apricot. Um, and you can see how big they can get and how much damage they can make inside the fruit. Um, those fruit fly there, the larvae, when they reach about that age, it's time for them to come out of the fruit. And they do that by crawling out through the skin, um, through all that damaged tissue, then they jump out, they have a, this jumping mechanism and they hop all around the ground uh, to escape predators and then bury down into the ground to form pupae. So the story, the total story is that the Queensland fruit fly can live 
from six weeks old, adult that is, from six weeks to four months. Uh, six weeks, they live only around about six weeks in warm weather when they're doing a lot of activities such as flying, mating, laying eggs, finding food and all that sort of stuff. In the winter time, they can live quite a few months, maybe even up to six months in some areas because they go into slow motion mode. They, they're not looking for mates, they're not looking for, fruit, for fruit to lay eggs into, so they're conserving their energy. They don't move much, they don't eat or drink much. Um, they just uh, survive on a bit of dew that might come down in the, in the morning and so forth. So, so she can lay 2,000 eggs in one uh, generation and uh, 800 uh, adults can, can come from that one female. She lays her eggs into the fruit and with the eggs uh, goes some bacteria and these bacteria help break the fruit down so that when the eggs hatch, the new larvae have got something to eat straight away. Um, some fruits sow sting marks, such as you can see on this locust and the apple, um, but others don't show sting marks, um, as you see on the blueberry and the cherry. These uh, marks are caused by the fruit in response to the bacteria and the wounding uh, by the insect. Uh, some fruit actually cause a corky layer to form around that egg laying site and that kills the eggs by desiccation and that happens in avocados and passion fruit but certainly not in these softer skinned fruits. Eggs are laid when the temperature is above 12 degrees and one to two days after mating. So that's a brief story of, of what happens. So we've got our eggs laid. The eggs are these banana shaped iridescent white um, bodies. They're around about 1.3 millimetres long. And then after about um, uh, one to two, three days at the most, the eggs split open and the tiny larvae, first instar larvae, pop out and start eating the fruit and crawling around. Over about eight to 15 days or even more in, in cooler weather, um, the small two millimetre larva becomes an eight or nine millimetre mature larva. And that's the one that I showed you the uh, moving picture of uh, before. And that's what we call a third instar larva. And it's at that stage where they come out of the fruit, hop around on the ground, burrow down into the soil to form pupae. And these pupae are about five or six millimetres long, shaped like footballs, um, and go from this pale, uh, straw colour to a darker mahogany sort of brown. They stay in the ground for around 10 to 20 days uh, and then out they come as adult fly, um, which takes around about half a day to become uh, fully uh, filled out with, with uh, blood and all that sort of thing, like a, a butterfly coming out of a cocoon. They can make horrendous damage to your fruit. Um, as you can see, uh, these are uh, young uh, larvae inside a cherry. They've gone from the skin where the eggs were laid straight through the centre of the fruit and started eating around the seed. And that often happens with uh, fruit with stones in them, such as uh, cherries and peaches, uh, apricots, as you saw before. Um, they certainly make a mess of, of uh, blueberries and every other uh, crop too. And, Here's some more damage here on an orange and in a peach there's hardly anything left of the fruit to see. So we have, when the larvae, like I mentioned before, are ready to come out of the fruit, they actually burrow their way out through the skin and these uh, 1 to 1.5 millimetre sized holes uh, come out where the larva has crawled out and then jumped out of the fruit and hopped onto the ground. Same with an orange. These are very, very um, green peaches from the Hunter Valley, uh, very small, but you can see that they had been heavily infested with fruit fly and the fruit fly have come out through these um, exit holes here. It's fascinating that if a population of fruit fly is allowed to get large, they will attack anything uh, that's soft and or that's slightly juicy, such as these hard green um, peaches. Um, so it's another way that they can become a big problem is that they will explore 
uh, all sorts of round soft um, bodies just to try to infest them and, and they lay so many eggs that it doesn't matter if they lose some but if they if some if they do win a few then that keeps a population going so any questions on um, what the damage looks like what the lifestyle life cycle is um, let me know that is a, a serious concern when they're going for the little fruits um, obviously we want to take action before we have a population that size but needs everyone to pitch in and, and do their bit. You mentioned about avocados forming a corky layer around um, uh, um, egg deposition sites. Is mm. that when I open an avocado and I find little lumpies, like lump, little lumps around the skin? Is that, is that usually, is that what you think it is? Yeah, that's, that's exactly the, it, what it oh. is. The avocado forms, I call them pearls sometimes, um, uh, just under the skin um, and it, they bulge out into the flesh a little bit. Um, it doesn't mean necessarily it's Queensland fruit fly, it could mm. also be fruit spotting bug and other pests that lay yeah. into the fruit. But yeah, that's the sort of thing. The uh, passion fruit, on the other hand, uh, gets a corky layer uh, inside the skin, um, mm -hmm. dries the, the, the the um, the eggs out, but unfortunately, with respect to the passion fruit, generally the fruit itself has a freak out and drops off um, at right. that time because of the fruit fly. The avocados don't, but the mm. uh, yeah uh, passion fruit too. Okay, that's good to know. Just one more crop to manage. Yes, yeah. The it's very rare, really, for avocados while they're still on the tree to become infested with Queensland fruit fly. And it's often only if for some reason that the, the fruit is damaged with a bird, bird peck or um, a stick wound or hail or rain damage or, mm. some, or something like that, that's made it easier for the fly to get in. Generally, they don't get infested. If they fall on the ground uh, and they start to soften, uh, which they often do when removed from the tree, mm. they can become susceptible to fruit fly uh, while they're on the ground. There's some discussion between scientists about whether fruit on the ground is susceptible to fruit fly. And the answer is, yes, it is. Um, particularly when there's no other fruits on the trees around at the same time. So if the fruit has been harvested and there's fruit laying on the ground, then the flies will go to it uh, and lay their eggs in it. So that's definitely uh, the case. So that's why cleaning up fruit after harvest or cleaning away unwanted fruit is such an important uh, job for both the home garden and the orchardist. Yes, absolutely. Yes, that creates a reservoir for the next generation and we want to break the generations somehow. And that's yep. one way of doing it. Very good, thank you. I'll uh, let you continue. In Victoria, um, in the past, and in Southern New South Wales, it has been stated by many scientists that Fruit fly will not uh, survive in those areas because it's far too cold in those in Victoria and southern New South Wales for them to survive. But they have become acclimatised to the temperature through the winter temperatures in those areas, um, and that's another reason why they're so difficult to get rid of once they get established. Is because they become cold acclimated or acclimatised to the cold weather. So what um, the temperatures they survive at in Queensland um, are much warmer than those down in Victoria, but the Queensland fruit fly adapts to Victorian weather conditions. So they do stay there all year round, unfortunately. This rather colourful map is a, is a heat map of Cobram in uh, northern Victoria uh, in the wintertime in, in May. And what that shows you is a patchwork of different temperatures um, over the landscape. The dark blue is only three degrees, but there are some parts of the, uh, of the town in May which are up to 14 degrees. Um, the, dark, the deep purple ones, uh, pretty, quite a few areas around there. Um, and if I was a Queensland fruit flyer, that's where I'd be overwintering. And that's in fact what happens where they go. So when you translate that to a backyard situation, for instance, you will find that if you looked, 
if you had a thermal map of your backyard, you will find there are patches in the winter time where are, which are warmer than other patches. So the house uh, being heated generally um, is, a, is a bit of a, a haven for fruit flies, particularly if there are evergreen trees um, around the house, which will be warmer and slightly more moist too because of humidity around them. We've found in the past that the odd lemon tree that's close to the house is actually a very good spot for Queensland fruit fly adults to survive the winter. And if I had uh, a fruit fly uh, trap, that's where I would put them in the winter time, just to see if I could get some flies out of the orchard or the backyard um, at that time. The same can be said for if you've got fowls, fowls or chickens in the backyard, um, they're often a bit warmer uh, than, than the rest of the, the yard and tr evergreen trees near to them, same thing. Uh, compost heaps also get warm and so evergreen trees near compost heaps uh, are a possible source for overwintering fruit flies. I might mention the compost heap too uh, in passing because, because it's warm um, a lot and because it's, that's where you throw your um, compostable refuse in, it is not a good idea if you do have any fallen infested fruit from around the, the yard or the orchard, don't dispose of it in the compost heap because that's actually a good spot uh, for fruit fly to survive, unless you can bury it and it gets to, to very hot temperatures uh, inside, which doesn't always happen in the normal household compost heap. So don't throw your vegetables out there or your infested fruit because you're actually supporting their survival rather than killing them off. Even within a tree, you will find a lot of variation in temperature. And here's um, a, a lemon tree uh, in, um, in cool temperatures, where at 5.30 in the afternoon, the ambient temperature is three degrees. So that's what the Bureau of Meteorology will be telling you, is the temperature around there. But in fact, in parts of the tree, particularly on the trunk and the exposed branches, it's up to 11 degrees. And if you go to half past nine in the same tree on the same day, ambient temperatures, the Bureau of Meteorology temperature says one degree, but there are patches in the tree that are eight degrees. So you can see how that Queensland fruit fly adults can actually find um, warm positions or warm refuges in a garden. They are very sensitive to infrared, so they can feel the heat and move in the right direction, just like a moth to a flame. Now we'll talk about traps and baits. Um, traps are best used in the home garden all year round. Not so much to kill off a fruit fly, but to find out when, you, when they're around and how many of them are there. So how, how bad a problem it is. And you'll probably know how bad a problem it is when you start eating some of your fruit and find them full of maggots, which is not what you want. So you really want to get onto these things uh, before that happens. So traps are good for monitoring whether or not there's a population of fruit fly around. Baits are not the most effective um, fruit fly uh, control method for the home garden, although they are very effective for orchards or large scale orchards. Baits can be effective if all the neighbours apply them um, in a, which is a term called area wide management. Um, and some townships uh, in Victoria along the Murray River are actually, uh, have actually instigated baiting programs for towns, uh, urban areas. And uh, one such town is Barham up, up north. Uh, and uh, it's actually been quite effective in reducing the, um, the impact of fruit fly in the towns. So there's a lot of different traps around, all different shapes, sizes, um, but generally in the yellow colour. So yellow is uh, a bit of an attractant in itself. And you'll see a whole range of different fruit fly traps. A lot of these traps are commercially available um, and, and so forth. So um, when you go to your produce store um, or for selling them, you'll find a whole range of different traps. All of them will catch flies. Some of them 
the bio trap, the uh, limb field trap, um, cone trap are, are very good uh, at keeping the flies in. Sometimes flies come in but then pop out again before uh, dying inside and sometimes that's a problem with the old DAC pot uh, but not, not too often. Sometimes you can get things that go inside the traps but don't have a trap around them. These are the MAT or the male annihilation blocks um, and you put a few of them in, in the orchard or the backyard and that kills flies that come to them. But what I said before, those in the backyard is mainly traps are used for telling when flies are starting to, to come into the, your backyard and approximately what the pressure or population pressure of fly is. So the, the, these ones previously have got pesticides in them, um, such as uh, malathion or uh, dichlorvos, which used to be in the old shell tox pest strips. But you can also get um, ones without pesticides in them. So this one here is called wild may uh, liquid, and it attracts males, uh, male fruit flies only. And it's basically, um, the lure dissolved in water and it's the water that acts as the killing agent, the flies drown in it. So there's a drop of or two of detergent or something similar in it to reduce the surface tension on the liquid and the fly lands on it and then sinks. You can get ones with sticky inserts in them such as these uh, four here. Um, in Victoria these uh, panels are, are not to be used uh, unless the panels are inside a cage. Um, in Victoria, uh, it, um, these panels have been found to attract too many, attract and kill too many uh, beneficial insects, plus also uh, lizards, frogs and small birds. So it's a bit of an environmental difficulty for Victoria. But once you put the cage on it, it's, it's not so bad in terms of environmental friendliness. And the same with these traps here. This is a sticky insert inside a, a trap, which, which works quite well, the bio trap sticky insert. Um, I have found that these two here don't really attract many fruit flies. So um, I find these ones better for use uh, for um, leaf miner in citrus than for um, Queensland fruit fly. Um, this one here is a brand new thing that you might see around in parts of Victoria. It's a, on trial at the moment and it's got radio signals in it and when a fly comes in, uh, the, the movement of the insect is detected and the fly can be identified by that movement and it sends it off via um, a, a radio signal or a phone signal to an app on a, on a computer and they can tell if there's a fruit fly in there or not. So. This one is just for interest sake at the moment um, and it's being trialled in Victoria and another number of places in Australia. So really there's, there's, there's three effective ways of, of making, of, of deciding which is the best trap. It has to be effective in the first place. So the lure inside, the shape of the trap um, and so forth has to be effective at pulling the fly in from uh, all other uh, attractions such as other fruit, um, other flies um, and warmth and all that sort of thing. And it has to keep the flies in there so that it kills the flies before they can get back out again and start infesting fruit. But there's other times, other thing, other aspects that are really important too. Recent science now suggests that if you put the trap or even a bait um, high up into a tree, you'll get a much more effective um, uh, monitoring or even kill of fruit fly um, because the fly uh, goes into the tree and goes towards the top uh, and the um, volatiles generally are heavier than air. So if you have them high in the tree, it fills up the, the canopy of the tree and the fly follows it up to, to where the trap is. And so they've found it to be more effective that way at the right time too, because if you put the traps out be, uh, after the flies are already built up in large numbers, um, you're not going to, to, to be able to 
act on the flies uh, beforehand. So I recommend you actually have the traps out all year round. And if you're starting a trapping program, start in August or at least early September so that you can uh, detect the first flies that they come in as the weather warms up. A number of years ago, I tested a few traps that were on the market then, um, but that was about five or six years ago. So there's been a whole lot of new traps then since, since then, which may be better or, or worse than these. But these are some of the aspects that we need to look at for traps are their efficiency at not only attracting the insect, but also keeping it inside or killing it before it um, can get out and do something. Uh, how long the trap lasts in the field, so its longevity is important. Its robustness, there are some traps that fall to bits when a spray vac goes past or the wind blows or a bird smashes into it or something like that. Of course, cost uh, is important. Ease of transport and packaging helps with cost and, and so forth to setting it up, um, keeping it running and so forth. So I gave it a bit of a score. So there's a few traps that work very well. The bio trap um, came out on top during this time. Um, and the cone trap, which is, um, where are we? This one here, number six is a cone trap. Bio trap is number three. Uh, are, are good ones. But there have been some newer ones out, um, such as uh, the um, Sarah trap here, um, the fru fruition trap, there's a blue version. Uh, this one can't be used in Victoria because it's not caged. It's a sticky trap, um, which uh, can't be used in Victoria, but it's um, garden version cousin, this fruition extra here uh, can be used. Um, so it needs testing to, to prove it, um, prove how well it works or not. Baiting is used a lot uh, these days in fruit fly uh, infested areas. Um, and the reason for that is that a lot of the pesticides that used to be used, dimethylate, labasid, and th so forth, are not allowed to be used anymore, uh, certainly not in home gardens, but they're heavily restricted on their use for use in, in orchards too. So baiting programs, this is the bait here on the leaf that you can see. It's often a mixture of protein plus a toxicant such as malathion. Um, and it's sprayed on in small uh, splotches like this, um, about 100 mils per tree in every second row of an orchard, or uh, to a certain level per hectare in, in um, crops such as blueberries and grapes and so forth. Um, it can be applied by hand or via a vat, via an all-purpose vehicle um, or a spray vat. Very effective uh, in, in orchards. And as I said before, not effective as much in the home garden if only one home garden in the area is using it. It really has to be done on an area by wide basis. But some of the problems with it, it has to be done on a weekly basis during the fruit fly season. Uh, otherwise, flies uh, will move in in the meantime and then infest fruit. Once the fruit's infested, uh, the bait does not impact on the flies that are in the fruit as eggs or larvae. And there's a lot of different protein baits uh, out there on the market. The nap flab is used with the fruition traps in particular. Pinnacle used in Queensland. Um, Eco Naturalua organics are uh, already mixed up, a, a, a toxicant, which is a, an organically approved toxicant called spinosad, um, mixed with the protein. And that can be applied and it's quite effective. And Heimlua is a South African version in liquid form of, uh, the, um, of the protein, which needs to have toxicant and add water added to it. So in that session, we talked a bit about uh, traps and baits and the best uh, shapes and places to use them and times to use them. So any questions?
Thanks, Andrew. That was really interesting. So in a backyard setting, say I've got just dinky die, quarter acre block, how many landholders do I need to collaborate with to produce a successful area-wide baiting program, given that we've all probably got a mixture of crops that we're going to be fruiting throughout the season, ripening throughout the summer and autumn? It's, it's a, a very big question that, uh, Steph. Um, normally, a, a bait will attract flies no more than around about um, uh, 10 to 20 or 30 metres away. So you would have to put these sp splotches of bait every 20 or 30 metres, particularly around the perimeter of your orchard and maybe one splotch on each uh, cropping uh, uh, fruit that's a uh, tree that's got crops on it. To have a whole area, it would have to be uh, an area ideally that's surrounded by uh, some other like a river, um, bush, um, uh, parks or something like that. So if there was an area, um, a, a several blocks of in a town uh, that has a, a, a barrier around it like that, then that whole area would have to be uh, baiting at around the same time. So it's, as you can see, it's very difficult to get that mm. uh, happening. There are instances where baiting programs have been used in urban areas run by uh, state governments, particularly this is happening in Perth and Adelaide right at this moment, where they have outbreaks of Mediterranean fruit fly in Adelaide and Queensland fruit fly in Perth. So the council in, uh, uh, or the, the city or the state employs people, trained technicians to, spray, to place these baits out um, on one in the front yard and one in the backyard of every uh, household in the affected area. And they're finding that that just that is enough to make it work. But getting everyone working together is not, without having the state government telling them what to do, uh, is a difficult thing. Absolutely. Yeah. You also mentioned chickens and it being warmer around the poultry shed. How can chickens be incorporated into our fruit fly management regime? It has been found that chickens, guinea fowl, uh, ducks, geese, all those sort of things are very effective at reducing fruit fly problems um, if allowed to run um, under the, 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 the crops and so forth. So they are very good and if they can be kept away from foxes and wild dogs and all that. So uh, they are effective uh, at cleaning up uh, fallen fruit. They not only do they eat the fruit that's fallen on the ground and the eggs and larvae that are in it, but they scratch the soil up, um, expose uh, pupae uh, and eat the pupae if they can find them. Um, so they are very effective. In fact, I've, I've seen this used um, on a mixed uh, semi, you wouldn't say it was commercial, but it was a large property uh, up, on this, up near Coffs Harbour. Um, and he actually fenced his mixed orchard, which was about two hectares of all different crops um, with chicken wire and um, ran his chickens and guinea fowl during the day um, and they cleaned up all the fruit that was falling on the ground, scratched away, um, even just broke up the fruit um, mm. and so forth and exposed it to the atmosphere and he was able to keep fruit fly down in an area where which is fairly heavily infested with fruit fly. So, so yes, that's good. Um, running cattle and sheep through orchards after harvest to pick up fruit that's on the ground is also very effective if they don't squash them and, and break them up and if they eat them, uh, depending on the crop. Um, so, yeah, so that sort of macrobiological control, yeah. I suppose, it can be quite effective. Fantastic. That's, that's great to know. Thanks. So some of the things that are, some of the other things that are available are, are for controlling fruit fly include netting or, or physical exclusion uh, is, is commonly called. So this entails actually covering um, either just the fruit themselves, as you can see with these peaches and tomatoes here, um, or a whole branch, um, or even a whole tree or a whole uh, row crop. These are capsicums. So, so you, and what that does, of course, is exclude the flies. So the flies can't actually attack the fruit through the, the, 
the, the, um, through the netting or the mesh or the paper bag. But there are some things that you do need to be, uh, uh, and, and sorry, before I go into that, these uh, enclosures are very effective at keeping out fruit fly, um, almost 100%, I would say, uh, depending on the size of the mesh. But the precautions are, if you put um, a mesh bag uh, over a fruit or over a tree, make sure that the mesh doesn't lay on the fruit um, that's on the outside of the canopy because the fly can just land on the mesh and lay into the fruit through the mesh. So it doesn't, so it'll protect the fruit that's inside the tree away from the mesh, but not the fruit that's on the outside of the tree. Um, timing is also very important. Um, um, because um, you need to make sure that the crop, that the fruit has set or the fruit, is, the flowers have been pollinated before you put um, the, 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 met, the uh, netting on. Um, and security is important because if there are any holes in them or um, it's not completely reaches the ground, flies can come up under them uh, under the or through the holes uh, and get in. So you can, for a, a full tree coverage, you can either secure the base of the net around the base of the stem uh, or the branch or the whatever, or you can um, make a complete house out of it using conduit or, or um, something like that and put sandbags at the base of the netting so that it secures it to the ground. Birds sometimes get in if they can. Um, and I had this problem with my boysenberries once, a, a coel got in and, and before it started to panic, it ate all the fruit first and then started to panic. So I lost everything and then the bird flew away. Um, the mesh size is important though. So the smaller the hole, the better. Um, as uh, some work done uh, by uh, Applied Horticultural Research uh, a number of years ago, found that two millimeter by two millimeter or one by three uh, were 100% effective. Four by five millimeter mesh was also okay with 98% um, recommended, but uh, effective, but larger sizes are not recommended because the flies will just get in. Uh, and the smaller sizes are also, even though they were 100% effective, but they caused a buildup of other insects uh, inside uh, the net. Um, it got more humid, less air movement and so forth. So thrips scale and mealybug um, exploded. Um, but then you also had quality issues because uh, it cut down on the amount of light uh, and you had more rot development because of the stagnant air inside. So mesh and net, meshing, uh, netting and paper bags work, but there are some precautions to take too. What pesticides are available for home use? Um, there's not many, not nearly as many as they, they used to be. And most of them are used to be only to be used within a bait. Um, malathion or maldazon, phythanon, all the same thing, um, can be used uh, as a cover spray in a bait or in a trap. But you have to remember that malathion is a contact spray only. Um, in, and that means that the insect, so when you spray it with malathion, the insect has to be hit with it while you're spraying it, or it has to land on um, the spray that's either still wet or it has dried and pick it up that way. So if your fruit is infested, malathion will not um, kill any eggs and larvae inside the fruit. Um, and really there's no, uh, and that's a, a spray that, that kills a fruit inside, kills a fruit fly inside the fruit is called a systemic spray. And there's nothing available for use in the home gardens that's systemic. So that's where you really need netting, uh, orchard cleanup. Um, and here we are mentioning poultry, sheep and goats again. Um, there are organic baits, like I mentioned before, that can be used. There's also another um, compound called uh, Rich Grow which is based on garlic pyrethrins uh, and other chemicals. Um, and they say that that does get rid of fruit fly. I suspect it repels them rather than kills them. Um, 
but sometimes it's not a good idea to use pyrethrins in gardens where you need bees because bees are, can be adversely affected by pyrethrins. Um, this is what, what you should be doing in, your, in every garden is to make sure that that, that fruit that you don't want um, is, is destroyed, so picked up and destroyed. Sometimes fruit can be damaged um, by hail, by uh, rain um, and by cold weather. They really should um, get rid of them, harvest them and destroy them. Um, fruit that's full Okay, am I still on? Yeah, oh. we just lost you for a little while there. You um, froze, right. but if you could relaunch or reshare your screen, I think, because we've just lost the presentation. Perfect, we're back. Oh, that's good. Okay, yeah, I just was saying that damaged fruit that you're not going to use should be harvested from the tree and destroyed um, or cooked or uh, made into chutney or something. Um, and fruit that's on the ground should also be cleaned up off the ground and destroyed. How to destroy it? Um, you can freeze it or you can drown it in, in water. It takes quite a few days for that to happen, say about two days of freezing, depending on how many you put in the freezer. Uh, two to three days of drowning. It has to be under at least a foot of water. Solarize is where you place the fruit into a plastic bag and put it out in the sun. And I've put the word care here because if you leave it outside, sometimes dogs, foxes and so forth will come to the, are attracted to the bag and will rip it open and that will, um, that will uh, destroy all, that will stop it from uh, doing what it was supposed to do. Heating and burning is a good way of doing it. Microwave, burning it, uh, and so forth. Burying it, I put three crosses against it because really, if you bury it in the compost heap, um, it could act actually make the matter worse than anything. Uh, so, last slide. These are the strategies to keeping fruit fly out of your region. You can remove the plant that has fruit, fruit fly host material on it. So remove the fruiting uh, plant if you don't want it. You can monitor uh, um, the progress or even the presence of fruit fly using traps. Reduce the number of uh, imports of fruit coming into your area. Um, I didn't mention this before, but a lot of uh, parts of some cities get fruit fly outbreaks based on people bringing fruit in, uh, cousins, uncles, aunts, whatever, coming in with, with a load of tomatoes that they grew in their farm, infested, bringing it home to, to the city, and then the people find there's maggots in it, they throw it out in the compost heap, and then you have flies everywhere. Cleaning, clean up the, your garden and your orchard, like I mentioned before. Trim your trees so that you can actually put netting on them if you want to, or uh, it makes it a lot easier to harvest the fruit if the tree is not too small, not too tall. Cover them with netting uh, or paper bags or whatever uh, is best for you, or treat them with baits, pesticides, and so forth if you're allowed to. That's about it, uh, Steph. Uh, so thank you for very much for listening. And if you've got any more questions, let me know. That's great, Andrew. Yeah, what your point about um, bringing fruit in and, and moving the problem around is is um, very topical. You know, crop swaps are increasingly popular, and everyone loves to share the harvest. We just need to be really careful around eating everything um, or um, you know, uh, solarizing or boiling or freezing any scraps before um, they exit the house, yeah. definitely. Feeding them to the chooks is a good idea too. Mm -hmm. Very good. In a trap, say, you know, I'm in my 
dinky die, quarter acre block, got my male fruit fly trap. It's high up in my lemon tree in a nice spot. What, what, what should I do whether I, when I catch one fly compared to catching, say, 10 flies? Yes, yeah, so when you find one fly in that trap, that gives you an indication that there are fruit flies in the area. And if you put the traps out early, August, September, and you get that one fly, you can probably surmise that from then on, fruit fly numbers will, get, will increase. So that's when you should start to keep an, an eye out on any fruit that's starting to ripen or get mm -hmm. sucked into them in, in your yard and even in the front yard or the creek banks or the um, uh, roadsides and that sort of thing. If there's any fruit around, have a look at them to see if they're being infested, to look for sting marks and so forth. So that first fly that you find is something like a call to arms, if you like, is yep. to start, re start you, you realise that this is going to be the start of the season. Uh, and um, you should look for uh, your for for um, um, symptoms of fruit fly in in fruit happening. When you start to get more and more flies in the trap, you have to make sure that you actually have the fruit trees that you want to keep covered with with a netting if you're in a in a backyard area or baiting if you're in an orchard or an area under area-wide management um, uh, strategies. Uh, and if you get more flies in them or you start getting flies in the fruit, then if you're in a, on an orchard situation, you can apply pesticides that are approved uh, to them or in a backyard situation, it is probably best at that time to remove the fruit and destroy them rather than let them stay uh, in the fruit and then spread to other air, other yards or other fruit uh, later on. So that's a sort of uh, level of, uh, of um, reaction to flies in traps. Thank you. That's, I think, will be really valuable. Um, what, do you have any suggestions for growing tomatoes? And for example, it's a, a favourite crop of, amongst most home, home gardeners, but it's especially with the indeterminate varieties there, flowering and fruiting constantly yes. and it's tricky to get a net on and 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 still have them pollinated. Do you have any suggestions? Yes, um, several suggestions. One is to start tomatoes growing early in the season. So if you have a cloche or a, or a, a, a little greenhouse uh, to start the plants growing or seeds or, or seedlings growing uh, under that sort of cover, in, in August, September, and then mm -hmm. them out uh, late September, early October. Um, and so the idea is to get fruit harvested before Christmas, New Year. If you can do that, you will have very few flies, if any, uh, in the fruit. In, southern Victor in Victoria and southern New South Wales, and even inland New South Wales, generally the fruit fly doesn't become a problem until after the New Year. Um, that's not, that's, I'm not saying that's always the case, but generally uh, that's, that is the case. The other thing with tomatoes is that once the tomato, when the tomato is green, it's not likely to be infested with Queensland fruit fly, even under moderate to heavy Queensland pressure, fruit fly population pressure. So you can wait until the fruit um, or the truss of, of fruit is a, a good size but certainly before um, the white star forms on the blossom end of the fruit, uh, which means it's starting to break, uh, yep. and starting to colour up within a day or two. If you can cover that, and I find covering them with a paper bag is better than um, a mesh bag because the, so if you can find, and I've tried desperately in the last year to find these, is those long um, lunch bags that are a sort of an opaque white and waxed, they are really yes. good to use. They're longer than the than the, the truss or the tomato, so you can actually cover the, mm -hmm. the truss, uh, tie it at the top. You can actually cut holes in the bottom um, and the fly won't go through those holes, but it'll drain any water that forms in there through that. I find uh, they're, they're pretty good. The, the fruit colour up nicely um, to the point where you can harvest them and then put them on the windowsill and colour up more. So... 
I find the paper, those wax paper bags um, very useful. So two things is the paper bag, uh, when the fruit is green, but not uh, ready to, to turn in color and grow, get them to, um, and if you don't want to do that, get them to ripen before Christmas. Fantastic, that's a, a great tip. Thanks, Andrew. No I think that's, um, that's all for, this, for today. Um, thanks so much. I think this is a really valuable discussion for the community and lots of um, coping strategies were discussed of how we can keep gardening with Queensland fruit fly. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about it. Um, and I invite people to ask questions through you and I can endeavour to answer them uh, if I know or point them in the right direction if I don't. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you, Andrew. Cheers.